Well hi and welcome to my shop this morning. I'm about to start work on this radio. This is a Stromberg Carlson a AM or broadcast band radio. Three knobs on the front. Ooh, wow. Fair size radio. Uh, looks to be in pretty good shape actually. So I'm looking for cracks and things of that sort. This is ice cold, just came out of my garage. A little bit of damage here, but it's... Yeah, that crack extends all the way up to... all the way up into here. It's something definitely to be repaired. It's got a back. It's got an antenna screw accessible through a hole in the back. Hmm. I guess Scott must have owned this at one point. Lots of stuff to read on the back. Caution, disconnect power supply cord before opening. Now there's no interlock here. This is a sticker on top of a sticker. You can see the orange sticker in behind. And what does it say? Warning, uh, any person installing or operating this receiver without first having obtained a license from the Minister of Transportation of Canada shall be liable upon being found guilty. Okay, I've read that sticker quite a few times. So, uh, you know, now that gives a hint as to what year this is. Um, because uh, they're concerned about spies, which is why the sticker's on here. So, I, I think it's probably post-war, but I'm not sure, frankly. Here's the model number. Model number... 561, model 561, cycles DC to 60, DC to 60, anything. <clears throat> Stromberg Carlson radio receiver, code number, I uh, think code number is missing, maximum input watts. Holy smokes, look at all that writing on there. Maximum input watts. Use only on the voltage and current shown on the rating plate located in the rear of the chassis. That's DC to 120. If battery operated, consult instructions to instruction instructions to for battery required. Hmm. Number two, for installation and operation instructions, see printed instructions accompanying this receiver. Number three, this receiver is not guaranteed unless standard Stromberg Carlson warranty card is correctly filled in and signed by the authorized Stromberg Carlson dealer and registered at the factory. 4A, under the warranty and the authorized sales and service dealer will take care of repairs, our obligation being only the replacement of the defective parts. And the last one, 4B, after, if after the guarantee has expired, this receiver fails to perform satisfactorily, call only our authorized sales and service dealer as he only has full information regarding the genuine replacement parts for this receiver. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. Doing their best to continue making money. Here's the tubes. They're in here. 12SK, 12SA, 12SK, 12SQ, 35 and a 35. That was very similar to another radio I just did. Two 35L6s on the output. 12SQ7, but there's no, looks like there's no uh, inverter tube for this. So, so how they, if this is push-pull, how they've done it, I don't know. SK, SA, SK. So it's got a front end. Um, a front end uh, tube. One, two, three, four, five, six tubes. Add them up. So that's 50 volts there and 70 is 120. So they're all in series. A big radio, no transformer. Okay, I think that's it for the back. Back to front, we didn't look underneath. What's underneath? 
nothing special underneath but some screws. So we know how to take it apart. And how about the power cord? What condition is it in? Okay, so I think it's in the kind of condition where you've got to replace it. That's what I think. Well, that's a twist tie. So I'm looking for any really bad spots on the cord here. Nice plug. No, it actually looks okay. Um, a little roughed up right in here, but I, I, it looks and it's it's cracking everywhere, so it's it's ready to be replaced. But it's safe at the moment. Let's take the back off and take a peek inside. Now, is this this is screwed into the cabinet? Look at the warpage in this. So I think what, what that says, with, with this thing, this warped, um, this has been in a humid location and the humidity has caused this to, to warp. Look at how bad it is right up in here. Wow. Now there's a sticker on the top too, a white, a white sticker. Let's see it up there. That white sticker says, has $48 written on it. That has 36 back here. So the price is, is higher towards the front of the radio. So if somebody wanted to get 50 bucks for it but didn't dare write 50, they wrote 48. And uh, this is my radio. I bought this as part of a bulk radio buy. So I didn't pay $48 for this radio. I actually paid 11 bucks. There we go. Let me get a screw bag here. See, I'm pretty sure there's an antenna right in behind here. Looks like it's still attached somehow to the chassis. Okay, so that's the way you're going to be. Um, should we try playing it just like this? It says, well, it doesn't say it works on this one. So I was told all these radios are working that I bought. And I've already had a, one come through here. <laughs> Not really. The Viking radio. Let's try it out just as it is. I mean, what's the worst that can happen here? I have ways of making this safe to do. Yeah. Ooh. That's quite a honker of a switch there. So off. This has got to be tone here. And this will be tuning. Good. The tuning thing moves. Okay, switch off. Now you can see the two light bulbs in the background. I'm using a dim bulb system to control the power reaching something like this. This is off again, yeah. Today's voltage is 124 volts. But as soon as I click it on, that voltage will drop quite a ways. In fact, let's keep an eye on that. And keep an eye on this light bulb. In case anything exciting happens. Okay, so this light just came on ever so little. Voltage dropped. So, it's drawing some current. That would have to, I think that would mean all the tube uh, heaters are working. Here comes a hum. So one, oh. So 
around 800 here. I don't know of any stations right around 800. No one has the time to go to the store and buy salt. That's what he just said. Well, I'm guessing this is 680. The last one was 740. 640. 590 Sports. Now 590 showing up in the right spot. Right on. Oh yeah, I mean, when I was riding... 640 is way up at 680. Well, it seems like it's the band is stretched way out. Let's see if we get the French station. So there's the French station. Uh, it's showing up around 9. It's, it's, it's uh, 8.40. This radio's picking it up really well. So we're off to a... Tone control a little bit hit and miss. Wow, okay, and a slight hum. I could hear a slight hum in there. Not bad, actually. Uh, yeah, I'd say you could say this radio works. Now I'm going to make it work really, really well. That's my objective. Oh, careful, Jim. I'm a broken cabinet. I'll crack it right in half. Now let's take a closer look at the crack so I'm not so inclined to be surprised at some point. You can see it going right along. It comes right around. Oh my gosh. When it goes right, it goes right up to here. Holy schmoly. Right up to where? It's right up to here. This whole thing is cracked almost all the way around. Get a little bit further and wow, every time you pick this radio up by the cabinet up here, you're, the whole radio is sitting on the base. The radio is pulling away from the cabinet and you're extending this crack. And uh, judging by the way it's going, that's the kind of thing that could just go crack right off. But this can easily be, be repaired and made almost invisible. It's in a hard to see area unless you tip the radio up like this. Wow, okay, so that's, that's, that's a big important job on this radio. Stop the crack. So the, the way you would do this on an airplane, by the way, and other materials, is you drill a stopper hole, right? So you have, you have the crack come along, and then it, it kind of ends right in this area. Take a drill and you drill a hole right where my finger is, right at the tip of the crack. And that produces a circular uh, hole. And there's a good chance that the crack strain, which is focused at the crack point, will then be spread over the circle, and it won't be enough to propagate the crack any further. And that's what they do with airplanes. Yeah, you think, hey, wait a minute, you mean to say airplanes can have a crack and they don't scrap the plane? <laughs> no, they don't scrap the plane. Look, they, uh, they stop the crack, they uh, rivet on extra plates over top to try to stop the crack. Yeah, well, what's a few cracks? You ever see that? Uh, shot of the airplane and then the roof came off. I think it landed in, in uh, Hawaii, I think. And with all these, uh, like, like maybe, I don't know, 10 rows of chairs, no roof above them whatsoever, just out there in the open. Can you imagine that? And that was from a crack. So one thing's for sure, I'm not gonna fly this thing. Here. 
So the other day I was listening on shortwave to uh, airplanes uh, flying over the Atlantic. I still use shortwave radio. And one of the few times I could hear the airplane just about as well as I could hear the uh, Gander air traffic uh, control. Boy. I think if people on the airplane knew what was going on in terms of communication with air traffic control on a transatlantic flight, they would be unnerved because there's an awful lot of, say that again, uh, repeat that back, everything's repeated back, it's repeated back incorrectly, I mean, uh, there's a lot. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's stunning, it's, it's not stunning, it's kind of surprising that in today's world, you would still have airplanes using sh shortwave radio for communicating on transatlantic flights. Out we come. Oh, well, this radio's definitely been worked on. The, uh, I'm not sure what's going on. Let's look in the cabinet here. Don't throw it away so quick. So there's that crack. You can see light through it up here. Coming all the way around. Yeah, the plastic up here is scotch taped in with scotch tape. And the scotch tape has gone yellow, and I'm sure if I just push on it, it'll just right out of there. And the grill cloth is simply on cardboard. That would be easy to change. Uh, that looks okay. And then the other corner is not cracked at all. So it looks to me like what might have happened here is some, somehow they broke this piece. And then that set up the crack, and the crack has just been growing ever since. Oh, look at this too. So, on this radio, when you screw in this back piece, you screw it right into the cabinet plastic, which is... Uh, and sure enough, this top corner one up here has, has cracked off. They're all heading to this. They're all heading here. So, uh, whatever kind of plastic this is, it's become fragile. That's for sure. Okay, we'll set this guy aside, but it's going to clean up really nice. That's my guess. I'm going to get a, a really nice look out of it. Now, let's see what we got here for a radio. So I noticed earlier the back paint on here is all cracked up badly. Let's take a close look at that because I think there's some fragility in it. So, yeah, I can easily see, uh, I'm not going to touch it now, bits and pieces flaking off here. The pieces flaked right off here. And I can also see some of this is kind of bubbly. And if I drag my screwdriver across it, I think pieces will pop off. So we best, best leave this alone. If I even try to wipe this with a cloth, I think it might be the end. The end. I mean, if you ruin this, you ruin the whole radio. It's that's what people see, right? So, and what do we see? The speaker looks very, very good. Yeah, it looks very, very good. Yeah, shadows just... Okay, what do we got here? We've got a permanent magnet speaker. Very cool looking speaker. Uh, two of Two output tubes here. One is different from the other. One manufacturer is different than the other. This says best best test. So I've never heard of this. B B E S test best test. I'm not sure what that says. Never heard of that kind of tube. That's an admiral tube. Another admiral tube. I kind of guess these two admirals probably went in at the same time. This guy probably went into service. A couple tubes got changed. There's the 12 SA7. You had a two part capacitor. I was hoping for a three part. You have a two part capacitor and a front end. Uh, I believe this is just a RF amplifier here. So that's not too bad. Uh, Tube. Not tube bad. Okay, what's going on underneath? Now, there's no bottom plate for me to forget about on this radio. <sighs> I 
one of the last ones I took it apart and put it together at least six or seven unnecessary times just because I forgot stuff like a back plate okay, so that's not going to sit like that of old wax capacitors all not not that all over the place uh, do I see any new capacitors other than that big orange thing leaping out at me here doesn't look like a single capacitor has been changed the high wattage resistor here fairly large capacitor strapped down back here strapped in um, See any? There's some high wattage resistors. Look nice. Is this still plugged in with power on. Yes, dummy. Thanks. So uh, I think we could be. Look at this. It's unbelievable. This uh, capacitor is made by a company called Tesla. What? It's a two-part capacitor. really in there nicely like it's really like this wire comes over the top of it that might be original you know uh, so looking at the top of the radio here you can see there's a place for a capacitor to be installed right there but I when mean, looking at it it looks to me like nothing was ever installed there So I'm going to guess a production change occurred while they were manufacturing these radios and they switched to this guy. So there's clearly uh, a B- minus bus in this radio going right through here. Like Many radios have this sort of technique. This is all bare all the way along. Other, in other radios, the B- minus is the chassis not so good and in other other radios the B minus is, is a wire like this but it's just different pieces of wire snaking along through the radio uh, it's not a clearly defined negative bus like that a couple coils in here one coil anyway I have a coil here um, so this one looks to be for sure the antenna coil antenna transformer probably at the front of the radio screwed in solid to the chassis here. Now what other chassis connections can we find? How much do you want to guess this big strapped in capacitor one side is on the chassis? Can, can we find it? So one side's coming to B minus. The other side yikes. Other side. It's in an insulated wire coming up over here so no it doesn't look like it's attached to the chassis something's got to go to the chassis here let's see they would never leave a chassis like this just floating isolated uh, in space it's going to be tied back somehow try to uh, so so here's here's a solder splash up here that's soldering these uh, uh, sockets down. These sockets come with a ground terminal. Here's one here, but it hasn't been used. And here's here's a couple here. They haven't been used either. Here's one that's been used way up here. And another couple over here. So there's a, a number of chassis grounds going on right up in this area. This is the the front end of the radio. That's the first tube up there. 
any other places where solid chassis grounding is going on. So, you know, so these tube sockets down here, they didn't bother soldering these ones to the chassis. They just riveted. Same thing here. Now, off the B minus, you would, you would probably have a capacitor going right to the chassis somewhere. Somewhere. Here's the power, one side of the power cord going right to the B minus here. So here's a capacitor here that's connected to the B minus bus and then tied to ground back there. And here's a resistor doing doing the same thing. This resistor is doing the same. This is a 20, what is that? That's a 20, this is a 270K. And this is probably, I don't know, 0 0.01. So these are probably the connection, uh, the, the connection uh, circuit to the chassis. Right. Those were the two connections I saw earlier that were made to the chassis, and it turns out they are the chassis bonding connection. I don't know what to call it. Safety connection. Something like that. Well, the radio appears to be in good shape. The capacitors look to be in good shape. I'm looking at the ends of them. I'm looking at how the wax is covering the end of them. Has the wax dried up? Has it receded? Oh, scare the heck out of me. Or is it, has it flowed? Has it flowed, flowed away? Can you look into the capacitor at the ends and all that kind of stuff? No, these all look pretty darn good. Doesn't guarantee anything, but this one looks a little rough. That doesn't mean much. Now we did hear a bit of a hum when I turned it on. It's probably coming from this guy. And I'm gonna guess this is original. wires down here you know everything everything is yelling that's original um, yeah so I gotta think a little bit about it now well, what do we want to do with this guy exactly what exactly do we want to do I'm going to stop for a little bit and think before before I, I start doing stuff. Okay, so I uh, managed to find the uh, schematic for this radio. And it's a nice schematic, so I thought now is a good time to go through it. And uh, we'll, we'll go through it from antenna to speaker. And maybe point at the radio now and then at what, what parts I'm actually talking about here. So let's start off with Let's start off with the antenna. So L, L1 and L10, it looks like a transformer sort of arrangement here, kind of clumsily drawn. So you have the antenna through a capacitor, coil, and then to the chassis. And that's it for the antenna circuit. It's actually not electrically connected directly into the radio, just through this transformer. Square, square. Why would they show these as square turns? Got to be some reason for that. Maybe that's to try to indicate. I don't know. Okay, time to look at the radio already. <laughs> so a little, a little tricky to see the antenna. So uh, not so tricky. Lots of turns of wire here. Got a capacitor here. That capacitor is going to the screw. So that that's actually a protective capacitor. Uh, to, to protect you from getting a shock. Um, let's see, so the antenna lead wire is coming here. Coming onto this one. It's not produced through the front. It's connected to one of two wires going to the loop, and then the other wire is coming back to this terminal. And this terminal is look, soldered right to the chassis here. So there you have it. From the uh, 
and this is the capacitor frame here. There's three wires. The chassis wire, capacitor frame wire, and then the actual capacitor connection here. Three wires coming back from here. Three, three wires. So th this ground wire, wow, it's really hard to tell. Okay, so this, this looks like a double loop in here. This is a typical thing uh, that they do. This is the transformer here, I think. It's very hard to see, but you'd expect three wires to come back. Oh, there, there's another wire down here. Now wait a minute, this is just going to the screw here, so that's... So well, that's what? I'm all confused already. Inside, outside. Wire right here. So I'm going to guess there's a couple turns hooked up to a pair of wires and then there's a many many turns hooked up to another pair of wires on the schematic. Let's take a look here. So we, do, so we have the term, this is the screw on the back, capacitor, just goes to the end of this coil, just ground it. Okay I got the picture. If you hook up an extended wire, then this coil becomes an important component as the signal on the antenna wire, which you've attached to the screw here, is now energizing this coil, which works as a primary against the square one here. Why, why they drew these differently, I don't exactly know. So the square one, if you don't hook up a wire on here, then this transformer is not doing much of anything here. And what you've really got is this loop with one end on the grid of the first tube and the other end just onto the, this must be the negative, this must be the negative, the negative bus. Not quite. So this is the AVC line here. Sure, coming back from here. So this is a nice uh, schematic, by the way. Uh, I'm going to go through it a little more, uh, a little more generally in just a moment here, as soon as I just figure, solve this little bit out here. So when I'm operating the radio here in my shop, I'm basically operating this loop, which is tuning against this capacitor and trimmer. And that's the front end of this radio into an RF amp. OK, let, let's keep going here. Um, now, when we look at the cathode, let's get these three lines straight here before we go any further. I'm going to start here at the power supply at this point. Skip to the power supply. So in this schematic, the power supply is shown with three significant capacitors, a 40, and a 40, and a 16 in the middle. But when I look at the radio here, in this capacitor, there's only two terminals. Did I miss a terminal? There's only two terminals here, and this capacitor says 50-50 on it, 50 microfarads, two-section two 50. So where's the third section that's on the schematic? I'm, I'm going to guess it's this capacitor, the one that's strapped in here. If I could see the value on it, it would help. Hundred and fifty volts. It's not helping. You know, I cannot I cannot spot the uh, oh you know what? There's a plus sign here. There's a plus sign on it. And this end 
push right on to the negative bus. So this is probably the third capacitor here. This is probably the 16. And they put two 50s. This really does, it, it, it looks replaced and it looks original at the same time to me. But that looks original down here. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go with the idea that what's in this radio is essentially the same as what's uh, on the schematic. So in other words, these three capacitors exist, except these two are 50s. Got a couple of resistors in here. So the power supply has three, 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 two, two outputs. There's one here and one here. This one is more filtered. It's further along in the power supply. This is a highly filtered output. Well, what are they doing with it? They're feeding plates. Tricky to see what's going on in there. I think there may be two screens in here. Screen. Screens and plates. Screen. Plate. Plate. Plate with a big resistor here. And the screen on the output too. Oh yeah, well when I first looked at this radio, I think I might have said there were two 35L6s. And then I quickly added them up. These voltages, I got it all wrong. Okay, there's one 35L6, of course. And I was kind of wondering how the second 35L6 was getting its inverted feed. It's not. There, it doesn't exist. It's a 35Z5 rectifier tube that makes up the 120 volt drop through here. Okay, enough of that. You're bound to get things wrong when you first look at these things. and. Uh, you know, with any luck, uh, whatever you get wrong, will you'll get right uh, a little further down the road. So, so, so they're using the highly filtered output on the plates and the screens. The less filtered output here, of course, is going to the output transformer and out the speaker. So this line is going to be a little more hummy than this one. But, but this one, the hum on it, the hum that may be on it, can't be heard anyway. It's just not high enough. It's not, not strong enough. But if you took this line and operated the tubes with it, that hum would get amplified and be brought out in the speaker for sure. So you need to send this highly filtered power supply voltage up into these critical parts. So that's this line. This line is the B plus, highly filtered B plus line. Now we come down to this one. So this line is to a cathode. So this is going to be the B minus here to a cathode and also to the tube screen, the tube shield, tube shield, shield, not a screen. So this is the B minus right in the middle here. And we have one more long line drawn on here, that's this line. And look, it goes right back, the last IF transformer, into the two diodes here that are rectifying the output of the IF. The rectified output comes down here, gets on the volume control. And this is the diode load, I believe you could say that. About this, 47K resistor here. And out of here comes the AVC. So this is the automatic volume control voltage line. And if you trace it, you'll see that through there and onto the grid. Go up through here. It's a one mega ohm resistor, but uh, it, it's, it's not that important because there's no current flow through it. And onto the grid one of the grids. The other grid is coming from the oscillator circuit here and there's no there's no uh, AVC control on that. I'm pretty sure. It wouldn't make sense. Follow the line further. Wait a minute. 
all the horses. It's hooked up here. There's no way a DC voltage from here is going to make it through this stuff, through that. Okay, no AVC control on the local oscillator. It doesn't make sense. It wouldn't make any sense to, to have done that. Okay, we're controlling through this coil, this grid. So it's three, three tubes are controlled. That's probably the end of the control. ABC control. Okay, so after being rectified by the diodes, the rectified result is sent off through here. Uh, this guy's blocking any DC, AVC DC voltage that developed in these diodes. And then the audio is sent on onto the grid, give it a little boost, and on its way to the output tube. Got a critical capacitor there. We need to make sure this one's not leaking onto the grid. There's a 150 ohm cathode resistor here providing the bias. Half a mega ohm uh, leak resistor here to uh, leak off uh, grid charges that you don't want there. And uh, tone control on the grid this time. Sometimes the tone controls are on the plate circuit. This one's on the grid circuit. And it's just a whoops. It's just a uh, treble snuffer with a one meg resistor here. One meg there. This is probably the key AVC capacitor. It's very small, 0 0.025. These are usually a little bigger. Is there another one? capacitor, this capacitor here. So, oh, this one's back to the chassis. Oh, okay, that's different. Oops, back to the chassis. Chassis, chassis. Any other chassis connections? So this is the resistor and capacitor that I thought would be the singular connection to the chassis. Okay, so I don't understand this capacitor. It's a small one. So, you know, this could be the kind of thing that the radio designers installed after designing and building prototypes of the radio and discovering that it had a unexpected oscillation in it or something of that sort, and they throw in, they discover. If you put a capacitor here, it'll snuff out that oscillation. Something like that, maybe, happened. I'm sure stuff like that must happen when they're designing these guys. So uh, that's kind of the, the radio here. Uh, nice schematic, easy to look at. Uh, let's follow the signal all the way through. I, I keep, keep right clicking by, uh, by accident there in case you're wondering what I'm doing. So the signal will build up in this coil, be applied to the grid, boosted through the tube, come out on the plate. DC block there, that's an important guy there. <clears throat> it's a picofarad capacitor is probably a highly reliable ceramic one. Onto the grid. Also on this grid is the local oscillator. The local oscillator feeding through um, somehow. Okay, so local oscillator oscillating somehow. I can't explain it, but it is. Oscillation on the grid tube driven into nonlinear operation the result is difference in summation frequencies come out here for everything that gets mixed in there and if any of them are equal to 460 in this radio they will build up on this tank circuit here and uh, produce a result in this coil
build up. Yeah, I guess that's an okay term. Any other frequencies that don't match the 460 won't build up here and they'll leak through and be snuffed out. They won't, they won't generate a, a signal over here. So by the time you get here, it's all 460. And through the grid of the IF amplifier, so it comes out much stronger now. Now you got a hefty guy here. Another tuned transformer to pass the signal over into the diodes that are rectifying it at this point. Rectified result uh, means it's, it's there's a, a method of recovering the audio after rectifying it, which is what's going on here. Make the audible uh, the audio audio signal useful. It's applied to the grid like. A already said before and amplified and drive the grid out here presto through the output transformer where the output impedance of these tubes are fairly high and the impedance of a speaker is quite low normally it doesn't have to be but normally it's quite low so you need an impedance conversion thing that's what this transformer is doing so the tube when it looks it, it feels the load of the speaker but it feels it through this feeling changer. So it feels quite differently to the tube. The tube thinks this is a high impedance load being added out here. Secondary, the output transformer, and that's gotta be the voice coil. Right there. Now let's go right to the front end of the radio here. We see the pilot light. So the pilot light is connected couple interesting things happen here. Uh, it's getting its its voltage from a tap designed on, on this 35 volt heater designed to produce 6 volts out here. So this tap, it looks balanced here. It's not. It's not balanced. It's way over on one edge. Gives you your 6 volts to run the light. And then they also run the B plus through the light. And I must stop for a moment. Okay, so I'm just in the last stages here of replacing the power supply capacitors. Here's the one I took out. Hmm. Tesla. Made in Czechoslovakia. Anybody want to suggest this is not a replacement? It's got to be a replacement. But here's the other one I took out. Now that's original, 16. So this one I'm replacing with this guy here, I've already replaced them. And this guy is replaced with the two up in the back there. I'm just shrinking some shrink sleeve here over the connections. And then we're going to test the two capacitors that I took out. See if I did the right thing. Okay, on that. So that should make the radio work hum free. And maybe from here now it's more a question of just testing the radio. So hey, let's just for the end of this video, let me just play the radio and make sure I didn't kill it with what I did. Okay, I think we're. Oh, I don't want to try the radio. I want to test those uh, capacitors. See if I wasted my time or not. So let, let's take it. 
let's take a look at those first. The first one is this great big communist capacitor. The commies made this. Positive one here. Now this is a electrolytic capacitor. They they're all a little leaky, you know, compared to a, your more typical capacitor. So this control on this tester has to be set like that to give a, uh, a, a a more meaningful indication on the eye. Okay, so we got 50 volts ready to go. Watch the eye. It's a big capacitor, it takes time to charge. The eye opened pretty much fully. 150 volts, this is a 160 volt capacitor. So, See, it's, it's not opening all the way. Okay, now careful Jim, that's a charged capacitor there. So I just leave it for a moment. This instrument puts a short on the capacitor when you let go of this control here. So I'm just gonna do it a moment, okay. Of course, with the internal leak, it probably dis, you know, discharges on its own. The other half, you can imagine it to be exactly the same. So 150 volts. It's basically the same. Now, would this make the radio hum? Um, why don't we try, let me put this back on. Why don't we try measuring the Valley. You can see the eye pop there. It's a good way to test to see if it's discharged, I guess. Give it a couple more moments. Then we're going to measure the capacitance of this. These are supposed to be 50s, aren't they? 50. Okay, let's try. I'm watching the eye now for where it opens on the scale. Right here. And we look down right on 50. Okay, so I, I'm not sure we can really claim too much about this being good or bad at this point. Now the other the other guy, now this one's more likely to be a leaker, I would think. Okay, we'll hook him up. Fifty volts, electrolytic capacitor. Just popped right open like a bullet. Popped open too fast. This is a sixteen. It should take some time, I would think, to charge up. It's really fast. Rating on this is one fifty, so I'm not going to go any higher with it. Uh, so we'll give it a moment. So I'm going to take a moment, and then we're going to check. It's rating 16, eh? So 16 be on the same scale. 16, where do you where do you pop open, pop and open? So when this instrument reacts at the very end of the run, that's not a particularly good sign. So I'm on the 0.1 to 50. There's no other scale. 0.1. So down here is conceivably 0.1. So this capacitor, sometimes there's a shadowy thing that takes place in here, very subtle. Okay, if we swing this around to 16, 16 is, uh, well, 6, 16 is right up in here. It's really tight up in this last, look, 5, 10, 50. So it's really tight up in here. No indication that it's working. It seemed to charge really fast no indication there's any capacitance except a very small amount could be the lead is off on this capacitor could be the, where the where the wire here attaches to the uh, the uh, uh, foil inside here maybe off this is less capacitance even less capacitance hmm. 
right up near the top here. That's the most sensitive I can get this guy. He's just reacting at the top of the scale. I, I don't think it's valid. And uh, this is 20 to 1,000. It shouldn't show anything there. It's a 16. Well, and we, you know, maybe we can conclude that this is a badder than the other. Okay, not terribly conclusive, but then often doing this stuff is not 100% conclusive. I think well, one of the things we got to realize is the radio was working with these capacitors in it, humming a little bit. First stage of the alignment, by the way, is to turn the uh, turn the capacitor so it's fully meshed and then observe the pointer to be straight across it's not straight across now is that because the pointer's loose on the shaft no no so right off the bat this radio right from the start is not aligned properly because the pointer's not aligned on the shaft properly okay but that's not what we're interested in right at the moment. We're interested in hearing this radio operate. So, switch is off. Power is plugged. Now, for, for sure, I'll be starting this with the dim bulb. This is really critical because I've changed things in the power supply. If I boobed up, I never boob up. If I boobed up, those light, that light's gonna save me, this one right here. Are we ready? I'm going to turn it on here and then apply the power. Watching the light. Yeah, just barely, just barely showed up. The volume. In case there's a wild hum. No smoke, no flames, no sparks. Great big hum. probably conclude that hum here comes the radio behind it the hum is not directly from the power supply I'm pretty sure of that some capacitor problems that's 590 it's right on 590 pointer on the shaft wrong 590 in the right place volume goes to zero lots of volume Wow. Okay, well at this point nothing else is screaming out, uh, hey I need to be changed. And uh, I'm not, not convinced changing those power supply capacitors has helped this radio very much yet. Uh, because we still have that. Where where'd that, where'd that go? The hummy buzz. Well, I think all that noise is received. You can hear the hum when a, uh, when this is disabled, when the radio goes quiet. There. You can hear it there. Well, again, you know, that sounds like a high impedance grid that shouldn't be so high. It's operating a little like an antenna. So we might ponder that situation, but for now, that's it for today. Ah, you need your muscles to do that. Fantastic. I think there's going to be a great looking radio when I get it done. Still not sure what to do about this situation. I don't think I can do anything about it. Maybe that's its look. Its look. Great. Did that light come on? I don't think that light came on. See you in the next video.